That's my radio program. That's that five minute thing, you know. You have to really go fast with that. But uh, since I'm the oldest person, and I am not 70 yet. I'm not 70 yet, but not far. Uh, not far away. Uh, I don't look 70, do I? No, no, there's women. <laughs> all right, so far I like all of you. <laughs> uh, so, what I want to do, I want to talk about some things maybe that I've learned, okay? Hey. Some things that I've learned. Hey. Thank you hear messages on that all the time. It's a good place to go. Some things I've learned. So I'm 70, so I know more than you know <laughs> about some things. Hey. I don't know how to frame as good as Jeremy Dean, you know. You know what I mean? I don't know how to, you know, as far as... Uh, framing a house. I don't know that, but there's some of the things, some things that I've learned, and uh, sometimes if you will, I'll be honest, if uh, if I had just listened a little more when I was young, I could have avoided, you can go around a hole without falling in it. And I've had a lot of people say, there's a hole, there's a hole, 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 pook. You know, I went right over into the thing. And uh, so, just some things maybe I have learned. Uh, as far as an introduction, every message has an introduction. Uh, you know, you learn how to do that. You got prep classes and so forth. I I read behind a man by the name of Will Rogers. Have you ever heard of him? You have to be old to know that. Will Rogers. He's an old cowboy. And uh, I I wrote down a few things that he said that he had learned. I thought this was real good. He said this, and most of these you heard already because uh, the world pulls off of these, and especially they are sent the email around the world. But he said this, some things I have learned. He said, hey, if you find yourself in a hole, quit digging. And that's, that's pretty good. He said, the quickest way to double your money is to fold it in half and put it in your wallet. <laughs> now, yeah, think about that. Uh, another one, he said, never ever miss a good chance to shut up. Uh, oh, no. Uh, this is, you'd have to give this some thought. Don't drink downstream from the herd. <laughs> All right. you can, if you're smart, you can look and see it's yellowish, brownish, whatever. If you don't, if you don't understand that, letting the cat out of the bag is easier than putting it back in. That is true. Uh, I found out never try to hang a cat. I tried when I was young. I tried to hang like a like cowboys in you know. Try to hang a cat. Well, it hikes that dude up here. I think like to scratch me to death. And, uh, let it down. There are two theories to arguing with a woman. Neither works. This is not me. This is Will Rogers. Uh, this is another one I found true with my life uh, out at sea. I spent the better part of all my life, lost life in the Gulf of Mexico, an old shrimp trawler. We learn how to do this. Will Rogers said, "Don't spit into the wind." What in the world does that mean? Let's let you think about it for a little bit. I've learned it. Don't spit into the wind. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, diplomacy is the art of saying nice doggy until you can find a rock, which is good. Uh, last one, he said a fool and his money are soon elected. Fool and his money are soon elected. All right, uh, let's see here. Uh, for uh, uh, for time's sake, uh, take your Bible and let's turn to uh, let's turn to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter. Yeah, I'm sure you know where this is at. Uh, let's read from emphasis. And uh, I didn't know what I was getting into when I was out here with these guys were praying. Uh, I don't know whether y'all have some kind of little cult thing going here or what. Boy, I've seen people, you, I don't know if you, some of you ladies see if they started getting in a circle out there. I don't know whether it's going to light a fire. Or you know. But, uh, uh, you know, so far it smells all right. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. The book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. Uh, Philippians chapter chapter 4. All right, uh, let's see, let's go all the way down for time's sake, verse, uh, all the way down to verse uh, 11, all the way down to verse 11, Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. All right, it said this, we can back up, we said crawfish in a minute, so let's crawfish to verse 9, okay, by verse 10. He said, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am 
there went to be content. Just the little words that's there. For I have learned. For I have learned. One of the plays that's used like that, and uh, I like this, it's in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30. Well, real quick, Genesis chapter 30, and all the way down to verse uh, 27. This is Laban speaking. Genesis chapter 30, verse 27. All right, Paul said, I have learned. I have learned. He said his learning was, and I'm going to look at the one that he has. He learned whatever situation he found himself in, uh, he was okay. Learned how to obey, learned how to abound, he was okay. Genesis chapter 30, all the way down to verse 27. 27. Genesis chapter 30, verse 27. All right, it said, And Laban said unto him, all right, it said, Who's he talking to here? Is he talking to Jacob? And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned. There we go. For I have learned by experience. And all that's me. For I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. And of course the message in itself, he knew that uh, God had blessed him financially because of his uh, feelings and his uh, hospitality to Jacob. Because Jacob, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, I know, I know, or I have, uh, 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 verse 27 again, I have found favor in thine eyes, Terry. For I have learned by experience. I have learned. I have learned. What do you learn, Brother Mon? What do you learn? I learned uh, probably not out of ritualism. Not out of what everybody else does. Every other preacher seems to do this. Every other pastor. Some of them, some of them, uh, some of them gets on their knees. Some of them uh, has somebody to pray for them. But uh, not out of just tradition. I, I need to. I need to pray for more. Okay? So, if you pray with me. Father, thank you for where I'm at. I am on a spot. Father, I ask that you come to our rescue and help tonight. And Lord, I appreciate just knowing about this place. And Lord, when I was in school, I sure would have liked to have gone to some places or some building. Or even had some pastor to invite me over to speak. Not that I was just practicing, but Lord, just the opportunity that's there. So thank you for this group that's here tonight and the opportunities that uh, this night gives. Uh, not just just to me, just one of the many speakers here. The opportunity that's given for people to open the Word of God or for some person to open the Word of God minister the word of God to other people. So we're thankful for where we are. We're surprised that we're still here. Lord, while we're here, help us to try our best to be of help, blessing to the saints, and then, uh, Father, a word of witness to those who are lost. Uh, help me to do uh, the job that would please you tonight, and that would honor your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'll be able to write things down. I have about 25 of these, and if I get to two of them, we'll be okay. All right? Some things you learned. said, what have you learned, Brother Long? All right? I have learned. Uh, I think life is a learning process. Uh, some people you can't teach anything to. You understand that? Uh, I've seen people that way. You know, I've seen uh, you know, I've seen kids already that way. I knew what it was going to like, I'd be like in the future for them as an adult because you couldn't even tell a kid anything, you know. You always want to be willing to learn, to learn. Uh, I'm still in a learning situation. Uh, there's one thing I have yet to do, and uh, I've got to finish. I have to prove to myself that I could do this. At 69 years old, uh, I am starting through a program that uh, perhaps uh, with the degree that I got from the School Bible Institute, and then from uh, Great Plains Baptist Divinity School, uh, uh, Dr. Tottingham, which probably is a, a Baptist brighter, but uh, uh, a military person of uh, master's and uh, doctorate of ministries, uh, as far as this PhD is concerned. You're talking about something that just, just, uh, just is against the old flesh. But uh, I need to discipline myself to learn. I not only just learn, it's worth the practical side of life. We're learning. You say, what have you learned, Brother Mon? What have you learned? I've learned this. You're going to write something down. I learned fundamental people. Fundamentalists suffer from what's called social anxiety. What's that? <laughs> Most Christians, 
Most Christians, don't put that down there. Most Christians take things too personal. And buddy, that is you. I'm here tonight, this is my job, this is my place, in a few minutes, if I'm not even like, I can leave, I'm parked where I can get out without being blocked in, you know, I get out of here, you say, what are you talking about? Most fundamental people, most Bible believers, they take things too personal. Are you listening to me? That's just about damage to the ministry that God has given me a number of times, uh, just suffering damage, just taking things too personal. In the book of Proverbs chapter 27 verse 6, it says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Well, the surest way to lose a friend is to tell them something for their own good. You will. I don't see how people like, uh, you know, I mentioned Jeremy Dean because I, I, he was just with us just uh, a, a little while ago. He didn't pay me to mention him that he's some famous person in this room. But uh, I, I don't know how the world would be like to have to spend time with some young men and to tell them, you're not doing this right. This is not right. Tear it out. Do it again. You know, I can just see. I can just see people's faces. I can just see the flesh. It's just so against the flesh. We take things too personal. Too personal. Uh, preaching. I'll be honest with you. What I found with preaching is this. A lot of people. Listen, sit, I'm trying to help you tonight. A lot of people sit in the seat. Just waiting for somebody to offend them when it comes to church service. I'm serious. Some of you like that. He said, oh, no, what is he going to say? What is he going to say? He's going to say anything different. What's he going to talk about the seat? Is he going to talk about this? You know, what's his convictions about so-and-so? Uh, is he really a Bible believer? Is he married? Has he ever been divorced? <laughs> Have you, you know, I'm, well, I'm going through some of these things like this, and people just sitting and just, uh, just waiting. It was like a woman or the mother. She had a son that played football. And this woman would just, she just worried so much. And uh, he finally conned her and he said, listen, mama, I'm a sophomore in, in high school. Please come watch me play football. You probably heard this before as far as the illustration is concerned. So she finally gets up and sits in the stands and she holds her head down and said, listen, how you've got to watch your son. And she watches him first play before long and got in a huddle. Then she started crying. <gasps> I said, what's wrong with you? She said, they're talking about me. They're talking about, her son was in that huddle, you know, they're talking about me. No, they're not talking about you. You know, as far as uh, thinking about uh, people taking things too personal, we do that. I remember uh, I pastored in the Ohio for about eight years and enjoyed it. Took a church from just, uh, you know, the bottom up and tried to, uh, you know, uh, Taken, I, you know, I, I, ha I don't know what to say because this is being, <coughs> this is being taped. I want to make sure I say the right things. I made, I made a bad mistake one time while I was there. Uh, you know, they took and uh, the people that was there, which is nobody is there now. They was there a long time ago. Even brother Neihaus was there. And uh, what it was is they had a southern, they had a young southern boy now that was preaching for them. And uh, it was good. They had a southern boy in here. And so they knew down south they didn't make any money. So this southern boy is preaching for them now. Uh, so I think they took for granted that, uh, you know, uh, you just, you don't pay a lot, you know. So what I did, I one time, say they're a year, two years, and uh, so, so wonderful people. Most of those people have passed away now. A lot of them are actually buried. And uh, I'm trying to put this just right. Uh, what uh, what I did is I said uh, you know just it just wasn't quite enough to go around just wasn't enough to go around just wasn't enough to go around just not quite enough and so I said can I meet with the guys can I meet with the men yeah sure and I went I made a mistake I made a mistake I asked for a raise should never have done that well you said why because I'm a southerner. <coughs> And what happened, I think one guy, which is now a missionary, he stood up back in the back and he said, we love you, preacher. And he said, we were hoping that you'd be satisfied with living by faith. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't mean that like that sounded. And so I said, that's it. Over with. Uh, you're dismissed. Gone out. Buddy, I went out and had me a little pity party. I told the Lord, I said, I left. I left the South. I enjoy being here. As far as this place is concerned, I've given everything I had. You know, just I just took what he said. He didn't mean that like it sounds. Why don't you just live by faith? 
want you to live by faith. I said, it's not faith I'm wanting. <laughs> I need funds. I need funds, you understand. And some of them were this particular person that said that was a very wealthy person. And I was over at his house a couple of two or three times and ate very richly type food. And him to have the audacity to tell me he was a southern boy. And I said, you better be thankful. We don't live in the 1860s uh, and so forth. I said, because something will rise up. I said, it's rising up in me right now. You said, what are you saying? I just took it personal. I took things to, you understand what I'm talking about? I just took things to personal. Learn how to control your emotions, you know. Uh, we have a strong radar for rejection, you know. Uh, problems come, a lot of times it came to me, being a southern boy, it came to me because, you know, I took seriously people's comments. And if you take seriously somebody's comments, then what you'll do, you'll take seriously their criticism. And the criticism is just, I mean, that, that just hurts. That just hurts. I would... Uh, uh, you say, well, what are you saying? I'm not going to be foolish and say something like this. If you say, Brother Mon, I appreciate your ministry, appreciate what you're doing. I enjoy your preaching. I enjoy what you're saying. I believe it's something in there that will help me. You know, I'm not saying like that. Go in one ear out the other. But I have to be very careful with that. Uh, I had a man say, Brother Mon, he said, uh, you know, and he mentioned a certain man that was as far as on the, uh, on the scale of 1 to 10, that man, as far as the ministry is concerned, he, he was number 10. And he said, uh, Brother Mon, he said, I enjoy your speaking. I enjoy what you said. You really helped me. And Brother Mon, you remind me of such and such a person. And, oh, it was somebody that wrote books. It was somebody that's gone down in history. It was somebody that's so-and-so. And I listened to that, and I said, well, maybe he's, what is he saying? What is he trying to tell me? And you know what he was doing? He was just trying to encourage me. I don't know if he got anything out of what I said or not. He was trying to encourage me. You said, what are you talking about? I don't understand. Watch taking things personal. You know, uh, I, I married a girl from Mississippi. And uh, she's, uh, you know, September will be 50 years. Amen. Same person. Same person from Mississippi. <laughs> I you said, well, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? I, she is as bad about this uh, as I am. So I've been, ooh, very careful. Very careful, very careful. You don't call no, you don't call no meal no burnt sacrifice. And, uh, you know that might be so, you know, pleasing to the Lord. It's not pleasing, you know. You'd be very careful what you say about what she looks like when she gets up. You know? You'd be very careful about things you say about her physique. You know, and, you know, whether thin, whether the other way, or anything. You just be very careful. If you don't do that, I tell you what, it wreck your marriage. I'm serious. The same thing with ladies, you know. Uh, you said, what are you saying? I, I wish I had time to get into some things I'd like to get into here. But I'm saying, quit think, taking things too personal, you know. Quit taking things too personal, you know. I bet my wife said, I tell you, I'm sick and tired of just being around you. And I'm, you know, I'm sick and tired of the way you acted. I'm sick and tired of you dragging through this house and so and so. And then uh, an hour later, she's kissing me. <laughs> so what do you do? You have to understand, as far as your flesh is concerned, I I do not take things too personal. I'm not to take things too too personal. It will actually uh, it will ruin my life. Let's go just a little bit further. Let's go just a little bit further. The book of uh, and the book of Mark, real quick. Mark chapter four. Some things I've learned. Stay away from taking things too personal. Okay. The book of Mark, Mark chapter four, 1966. I uh, took and uh, visited Brent Baptist Church in Pisco, Florida. And uh, I had uh, heard, I had uh, a couple of three or four months ago, had been, uh, felt like the Lord called me to preach. And as far as school is concerned, I attended a year at William Carey College in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And it's just a very, uh, today it's, a, you know, it's an institution that you would say it would be a liberal institution. I knew what was basically out there, and I said, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to school. Boy, I, I, I wish I could take uh, and be trained just in the Bible, where I could just go get the Bible, where I could just go get the Bible. And so, uh, through uh, Rescue Mission in Mobile, a particular person that was there, 
Uh, Dr. Ruckman had just begun the school one year and he had given this particular person some applications. This particular person gave me an application. I went over to Brent Baptist Church, went there one night after the service was over with. I walked down forward and uh, said something to Dr. Ruckman. He, I said, uh, you know, I heard about the school. I'd like to come to school. He said, come if you want to. And he turned around. <laughs> You don't, you know, you don't talk to somebody that way. <laughs> you just don't talk to somebody that way. And I said, I tell you what, hell, it freeze over before I, before I come this away. And I said, I can't imagine somebody that cruel, you know, if you want to come, you know. So, so you know, well, just turn around, turn around. He didn't even. I drove an hour and a half just to come over there. You know. And as far as, I'll be honest with you, as far as the church, there was one woman in that church, and it was, it was averaging about 800. There was one woman in that church shook my hand. That was it. I said, it's the coldest, deadest place I've been in my life. I said, yeah, I'd rather go to, you know, I'd, I'd rather go to a liberal, you know, place, and, you know, something like this. But it was just the Lord, you know, working some things out to see whether I was serious about such. Quit thinking, quit taking things too personal. Quit taking things too personal. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Let me take you down to the sea just for a few minutes. The book of Mark, Mark chapter 4, all the way down to verse 35. Go down to verse 35. He said, what are you saying? <coughs> I have learned, that I have learned, and I hope I have learned. And uh, for the past couple of two or three years, this has not affected me as much as it uh, you know, has before in the past. One particular time, it could have destroyed my ministry. I just took things too personal. I just took it too personal. The book of Mark, Mark chapter 4, all the way down to verse 35, and it says this. On the same day when evil was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over to the other side. You know the context. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. It says, And there were also with him other little ships, and there arose a great storm of wind, the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. Verse 38, it was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him, say, awake him and say to him, Master, cure us thou not that we perish. What I want to do is just for a moment, I want to see if I can bring this to life to you. Uh, the context, of course, the Sea of Galilee, uh, you know, where the Savior uh, uh, took and uh, was in chapter 4, we want to do for five we can see some of the parables that's there. And uh, the crowd has been dismissed. And he says something like this, let's pass over the other side. They're going to go to the east. They're going to, they're heading across the, the Sea of Galilee there. And uh, what takes place? What takes place? They find trouble. So this is one of the things I've had to learn. I had to learn the hard way. I've learned that following, and we'll get into this a little more. I've learned that following Jesus Christ doesn't keep me from difficulty. Amen. We all are about the charismatics. Sorry, charismatics, they all and just all flesh. You never grow in a charismatic church. And the charismatics this and the charismatics that. And we picked up a charismatic, charismatic doctrine, and that is this. When things don't go as we think they ought to go, you know, we just uh, we get kind of wild about it. And we don't understand that. You know, what is wrong? Something happens. I have a flat tire, you know. Ah! Oh, you know, Simon Peter comes out in me. Well, what in the world is happening here? You know, what's, why is it flat top? I'm late for this meeting. You know, what's going on? You know, I, I don't understand that. Following Jesus Christ doesn't keep you from difficulty. We look at these people right here. In this particular passage, we have, we have uh, if you look at it within its context, you have men now that have followed Jesus Christ. Men now that have sacrificed everything, men that has left their wives and their families, and they have followed the Lord to this particular place right here. And now they're in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and they're fixing to drown. They're fixing to drown. They just, I mean, the, you know, I know the Lord is there, but these people are fixing to drown. Uh, I understand the way of the transgressor is hard. I, I understand that. And, uh, but uh, that, that's not for me. I'm not a transgressor. I'm trying to do right. I don't want it hard. I want, I'm a fair weather sailor. Hey. We used to leave out of the port of Bonsacour, Alabama, out down past Fort Morgan, out Mobile Bar Pass. And I tell you, I've seen that pass, so that pass at 6, 8, 10, 12, 15 foot seas. And just, my dad just said something like this. He said, just grit your teeth. But I never did like that. Somehow I just never did like it. 
Just like I, I prefer it being smooth. I don't like confrontation. I'm not like some of y'all. I don't like confrontation. You know, I don't like it. Here's this dog. He walks across the property. He never does anything. I don't even bother him. Some of you get, I told a BB gun to pop him in the rear end. <laughs> just to see what's going to happen to him. He just like a confrontation. I had a pastor friend of mine. I said, how is it in your church? He said, man, ain't nothing going on. He said, it's just, it's just, it, nothing's going on there. Everything is just nice and quiet. He said, I'll fix it up some. And he started to stir. He started a mess. I'm not that kind of person. I am a smooth weather sailor. And I, 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 you know, I don't like it when it's troubles. Uh, when there's trouble. And, uh, but I understand as far as life itself is concerned. How are you going to take and drive a car and sooner or later it's not going to have mechanical problems? But we think, uh, I'm serving the Lord, serving the Lord, doing the best way I can go. How? Why the trouble? Why? I don't understand why the trouble. You know, you put saying that. Why, do you? That's just the way it is. Here's some people that sold out everything and they're in a boat and they're soaking wet and they're fixing to drown and they sold out for God. What's the deal here? Don't understand. Following Jesus Christ doesn't keep you from difficulty. Uh, we think about driving a car. Sooner or later, if you drive it enough, you're going to have a wreck. Amen? As far as your house is concerned, uh, how in the world are you going to live in a house and there's not constant upkeep? There's something there. How are you going to live in a world of disease and not be exposed? How are you going to be married and God blesses you with children and not have stress and hurt and heartache and anguish and tears? It's just there. It has to be accepted. It's just there. I have learned following Jesus Christ doesn't exempt me from difficulty. Satan is the order, uh, author of disorder. What's happening here? Satan knows what's going to take place in chapter 5. You know what happens in chapter 5? Where's Jesus and this bunch going? Oh, where are the gatherings? Remember who was over there? It was a crazy wild man. A... <clears throat> Uh, a bad dude in a bad mood, a rude dude, a new dude in a bad mood. <laughs> uh, so I forget how he is. You know? But uh, the, devil, the devil knows where they're going. And he's trying his best, so what he does? He's just shaking the boat. He just takes the boat and he's just shaking it back and forth. And I, I, found, I found, as far as the ministry is concerned, that there are some troubles that are so severe, they just reach the point of despair. And that's where they are here. And there rose a great storm of wind. The wind uh, waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, cares thou not that we perish? They know they're fixing to drown. This is not, uh, this is not land lovers. These are people that know the sea. These are people that understand things about boats. These are men that built boats to be able to travel across the Sea of Galilee. They understand what's going on, but yet they're almost to the point of despair. They, uh, they, they, they're rowing as hard as they know to row. Uh, you know, keep the bow into the, uh, keep the bow into the sea. You know, uh, uh, they're, they're pulling. Uh, they got buckets, you know. They got no way to turn on no electric pump. There's no such thing back then. They got buckets. They're throwing water. And they're trying their best to keep everything afloat. And it gets to the point where it just, no matter how much effort they exert, there is no hope. The boat is full of water. Their clothes are wet. It's cold. They got no life preservers. They bailing as hard as they can bail. They're making no headway. The sea is coming inside the boat. They're fixing the sink. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I find here that uh, what the problem was, the problem was verse 40. And uh, it's kind of a message in itself. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? My problem is it, <laughs> it's not that I have no faith. My problem is that there's water in this boat. What is Jesus saying? What's Jesus saying here? He's saying this, you have no faith. So what's the bottom line for this in a message? And some of you want to work on it. They really did not know who he was. They didn't know who he was. How in the world are you going to sink with Jesus Christ aboard that's there, you know? They had watched him in Mark chapter 1 cast out devils. And, uh, and healed Simon Peter's wife. He healed all kinds of diseases right in front of them. He forgave people's sins right before them. But they still did not know who he was. They had the Son of God in that boat. But they did not know who he was. 
Some of it, I think, trouble, the Lord just allows trouble in our life, whether you're young or old, just allows trouble, just the, the seeds of life, just to overcome us. And, it, you know, trouble just to drive us to the point whereby we don't understand what this Christianity really is all about. I don't really know Jesus Christ like I should. I know about Him. I have read about Him. I have prayed to Him. But I really don't know Him like I should. So what happens in life? Life begins to just take and uh, take its toll on us as far as just trouble is concerned. I've had Satan just take and push me, just like he just pushed me beneath the surface of the water. Just push my head down, and it's like I was under the water, and I wiggle. I don't know. How am I going to make this? I don't know how I'm going to make this. Somehow, I did find that Jesus, that Jesus cared, that Jesus really cared. You say, what are you saying? What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying this. I'm saying a lot of times I have been like some of the charismatic folk that in their life, some of those folk are really saved, but those folk live as to their feelings. But being true, you never grow. You'll never grow because you've got to learn that there's a spirit life about Christianity. Not just not just I feel good, you know. Uh, not that I, you know, I don't feel good. What have you learned? What have you learned, Brother Mark? I learned that I take things too personal. I learned that sometimes I do not understand how that serving Christ, I don't understand how trouble still sneaks in alongside my life. Don't understand that. Don't understand that. Can I go one more real quick? One more. I, I've learned this. I've learned that I have taken the course of, of so many years now, serving the Lord at 40 in 46 years of ministry, I've learned that I really, and you preached on this before, and it's good, I've learned that I must redeem the time. Mm -hmm. Now, what is that? You, We've talked about that before. Uh, you, know, um, you know, I'm sure you've had this in class, you've had it in church. What does it mean to redeem? Uh, it's quite like, uh, you know, it's quite like the doctrine of redemption. We think about Christ. It's Christ's blood that purchased us. So we think about redeem the time. I have to purchase it. I have to take and rescue it. Why? Redeem the time because we don't have time to go there. Because the redeem the time because the the days were evil. You said, why was I redeem the time? Because evil days will get it. The evil days will get it. You said, what are you talking about? You know, as far as life itself is concerned, Satan will take and he will grab your time. And uh, he will take, as far as time itself is concerned, just 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 pull it pull it from you. I've had to learn some things about redeeming the time. I first of all know that it is from God. I have said it at times. It's my time. It's not your time. Amen. It's not your time. Time came from God. What well, Genesis chapter one? By the time you got down to verse fourteen, he said he gave the sun, the moon, and the stars even to calculate time. Uh, before he, before this time, there was eternity. But as far as this earth as we know it. Uh, time. You know, if God begin it, then God can end it. So it's going to be a time where time will be no more. Revelation chapter 10. Alright, since time is from God, I can't stop it. I can't slow it down. I can't adjust it. Right now, it's taking away. I can't adjust it. Yeah, I mean, it's getting on. I can't bring it back. I can't retrieve it. We think about 2012. There is a block of time that's gone. That's gone. We've got a block of time before us. 213. Time. It's given equally to the rich, to the poor, to the strong, to the weak, to the ignorant, to the wise, to the black and the white. And you know what I do with time? Same thing you do. Shame on you. I worry about it. I worry about it. I worry about even coming over here tonight. I said, what in the world is these guys? Are they trying to get Are they going to do a split deal? Are they going to, what, are somebody going to take over something? Somebody is doing something. You know, I wasted my time thinking about something like that. I'm not going to have to pray. You know, worry over it. Worry over it. Worry over it. Kind of, kind of like a woman with a son playing football. You know, she thought they got in the huddle to talk, uh, you know, talk about her. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, be careful for nothing. So what does that mean? Just don't be full of care. You heard the story about the three turtles? Three turtles. There's Daddy Turtle, Mama Turtle, and Junior. You know how turtles are. They're not very fast. <laughs> junior after Junior was born, days and weeks and weeks and days later, here's mom talking about picnic. Listen to me, I'm going somewhere. Picnic. And he told his mom, year after year after year, picnic, I'd like to do this picnic. So she finally talked to Daddy 
Turn and he said, okay, we'll do a picnic. So they got everything together, started out on the picnic. You know how turtles are, so they, they took off to try to find a spot one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, a week, two weeks, a month. And they finally made it there. All the stuff out all over the ground, Jerry's about to go crazy. And uh, uh, the picnic, and finally, I mean, finally after a whole month, finally, all of a sudden the mother says, no, 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 They said, what happened? She said, I left the basket of sweets at home. <laughs> Uh-oh. So she said, tell Junior. He said, I know, I know, I know. He said, Junior, you got to go home and get the basket of sweets. He said, just as sure as I leave this place, y'all will eat without me. And uh, the father said, I promise you, we'll not eat without you. Just as sure as I leave this place, you will eat without me. He said, I promise you, we will not eat without you. You promise. I promise. So here's Junior. So he's supposedly gone. He's all back to the house. One day, two days, three days, a week. Two weeks, three weeks, a month. Mom and Dad get together and said, well, he's made it home. Five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, and they're looking for him any moment. Nine weeks, and there's no junior. Dad said this. Well, I don't know what happened to him. The thing that we just must do is we just spread it out and let's just eat. Junior jumps out behind the tree and he said, I've been watching you for weeks and weeks and weeks. And he said, I worried and I worried and I worried. I knew you would eat without me. I knew you would eat. I ain't going home. I ain't going home. <laughs> That's just like you at times. You said, that was dumb and stupid and silly. And you know, does the joke have any benefit to me? Yes. You worry about stuff that's about as stupid and silly as that, you know. Same with us. What do we do with time? I'm supposed to buy it back. And I'm worried about it. I'm supposed to buy it back. And I'm worried about it. Not only do I worry about it, but sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I just waste it. I just squander it. Squander it. Most of the time, I waste it in minute form. You take a bucket, you know, we take a five-gallon bucket. We can put here, and I can put a small, maybe put a quarter of an inch hole in that bucket. And uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, it will empty itself in time. Just like I kick it over. Full of water. I fill it full of water. It's got a little hole in it. It will empty itself in time just like I would kick it over. Just take some time. He said, what are you talking about? Just a little moment. 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me. Didn't ask it. Didn't choose it. Yet it's up to me to use it. I uh, must give an account if I abuse it. Just a little minute. Just a little minute. Just a little minute. Let's go kill some time. No, no, no. We need to redeem it. A lot of times I spend it on myself. I need to redeem the time. I need to, you know, I spend it on myself. We think about the hunger of the flesh for pleasure, for prestige, just for things, just for money. We think about selfishness. You know the illustration we used about the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, it has millions of tons. I think it has five million tons of water daily dumped into it. Why is it dead? Why is it dead? There's nothing goes out. It's just all, it's just old salt sea. Why is it dead? So, we think about time, time, time. I worry about it. I waste it. Spend time on myself. You can actually shorten time. And uh, you said, no way you can do that. You know, and I believe in the sovereignty of God. I understand God's in control. I understand all that. I know I have the Calvinist, you know. But I, believe, I do believe ultimately God is in control. But in truth, how in the world could you say it? You shorten it. Ecclesiastes 7, 17, it says this. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? I believe you actually do that. Yeah. I believe you don't take care of yourself. You know, you don't take care of your body. You don't take care of the temple of the Holy Ghost. It says, Him shall God destroy. And that's a message in itself. I dare ain't going there. That's between you and God. But you can actually shorten the time. I always believe this. If you ever gone to a restaurant and they give you a little thing here and what it does, they buzz you when they let you in there. You ever had that? 
I always thought this. I, I, I believe it to be true. If you die, and you die before your time, I believe you're going to have to sit outside. And you have a, God's going to give you a little buzzer. <laughs> and when God buzz, when God, when your time is up, maybe you die 15 years ahead of time, you're going to sit out 15 years. He said, that ain't bad in eternity. I, I know that ain't bad in eternity, but God buzz you in after that. You say, is that, doc is that doctrine you're saying? No, that's not doctrine. That's just uh, what you call the fundamentals. <laughs> you say, what am I supposed to do with my time? My time? My time. You need to invest it in the things of God. Amen. So Amen. don't, you know, don't cut yourself short with thinking about praying, thinking about the Word of God. You know, it's not necessarily how much. I understand the quality that's there, but invest it as far as uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I did when I was young, and I thought the ministry was uh, basically just investing yourself in the life of other people. And uh, I think that has eternal value to it. Things, uh, things last just a little while here on this earth, but people last forever. Uh, finding needs of people, you know. Uh, taking and reproducing yourself. I've seen people say, I'm about the greatest thing that God has. We well, invest that in somebody else. Then there'll be two greatest people that God ever has. You know? you know what I mean? Invest in the lives of people. It's for the same thing as for church. Invest your life in church. Don't get turned off as for church. You know, uh, church is never 100% right. Uh, I've always felt bad about Bible Baptist Church. This is going on tape. You said, why? Uh, because uh, uh, when I was there, I thought, it was just, I thought it was just perfect. And then I went out in the ministry and started a church and found out it wasn't perfect. You know, you said, uh, what were you talking about? Still, as far as church is concerned, local church, investing your time in a local church. Uh, things to do. You know, I seen a situation one time where a man, he was retired. You know what he actually did in that church once a month? Once a month in that church, as a retired man, he went around in the church and he oiled every hinge in that church. Every door hinge. He oiled that door. You go in that church, he went, you know, like you're going in some haunted house, you know, and he oiled the hinges. You said, it's that important. He was investing his time in something like that. Invested in, we think about uh, music in, uh, just a lot of different things, just just an investment. I, you know, if you don't do that, what's going to happen to the judgment? They say you, just, you spend 20 years sleeping, you spend 20 years working, you spend 6 years eating, you spend 7 years playing, you spend about 5 years dressing yourself. Uh, this is an old one here. They said one year on the phone. <laughs> you spend three years texting, you know, at least a couple of years on the cell phone, you know. And as far as church, the average church person spent about maybe a year and a half in church or with church and family things that have to do with spiritual. How's that going to look? So you say, what are you talking about? Redeem the time. Time ticking away. Tick, 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 ticking away. So, you know, don't feel bad about it. Give it to God, you know. Give it to it. Give, give as much to it. Uh, to God as you can. You say, what about my family? That is you giving it to God. You know, that is you doing right that's there. Uh, so, as far as time, learn how to redeem the time. I could go on and on with those things. I'd like to say the ministry is under constant fire. I'd like to say every person has an influence. I'd like to say that I found, uh, I found uh, satisfaction from service. Satisfaction from service. I found knowing this book without living this book is a death sentence. Amen. You think about that for a moment. Amen. You know, knowing this book, because when you know it, when you begin to know it, then it's required of you. Amen. And I've seen people, I've seen, I've gone to churches, this is, uh, I've gone to churches, and they knew about Westcott Horn, but they couldn't pray. They didn't know how to pray. But they knew about West Con Hort. You know, say, what, what are you talking about? I'm saying this. Maybe you need to know about West Cotton Hort. <laughs> to me, this, you know, know the book without living the book. This book demands that you live what you see. That's what's so hard about it. That's what's so hard about this book. I guess I found ultimately, I close with this. I ultimately, about everything in life, I found God to be faithful. Amen. The third year, I said this before, you might have heard me say this. But the third year of ministry in uh, uh, Bible Baptist, we think about uh, the institute that was there. 
Uh, the second year, Dr. Oakley played a trick on us. And uh, what he did, he started increasing the amount of courses we had to take. So what he had, he had night school, and then he had day school who? From, uh, from uh, 6 to 10 at night, and then from 9 to 12 at the time. So we just come up to him and we say, hey, you know, how do you expect us to work? He said, that ain't my problem. <laughs> That's your problem. Lord wants you here. You've got to take care of that. You know, so... As a lot of people just washed out. As far as my class is concerned, we've been, we began with 27. We graduated seven. You said, uh, uh, what are you talking about? If it were not for the fact that I was a commercial fisherman and I worked all night. I worked all night in Scambia Bay, East Bay, over here. Worked all night. Away. Come home, get a shower early that morning. We go to class from 9 to 12. Come home, get maybe an hour or two nap, you know. Uh, spend some time with my family a little bit, uh, uh, get back to school again, and get out of school, jump back on the boat, take off again. And uh, so uh, there was a bad year with commercial fishing. I think it was 1968. And there was no way I could go to school that next year, just finances. And uh, just, you know, we just could not afford it. It got, uh, it got, you know, it just got hard. Everybody has a hard look story, so you didn't have to listen to mine. <laughs> and uh, except this was real, this was realistic to me. And it got so bad that my wife one time when I came home uh, from school, she said, uh, "I uh, I love you." And uh, I had my daughter then. And she said, "I love the Lord. And I know what's going on. I understand this. I, it's not just a lack of faith, but it says there is nothing." She said, "I can do without food. You can do without food. But our daughter needs milk. There is no milk." I, what's the bottom line to all that? I found that through that, God was faithful. I had uh, begun over in Foley, Alabama, I had begun a little simple radio program. Uh-oh, Holy Ghost fixing my lead. I have to. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I began a radio program, and you can imagine what happened. There was a man from Maine side that was a pilot for the Navy. He had, they... I think he run the, or he was uh, doing the A, uh, boy, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the number there, but uh, uh, a pipe, he was going from there to Beeville, Texas, and he was coming through uh, the north side of Foley, Alabama, into <coughs> Beeville, Texas, back then, the no Interstate 10 as we know it, like we know it now, and uh, what do you have, he's going across the radio, and he picked up the station that aired our program. And uh, I had a 15-minute program, and I stumbled and stammered through a bunch of stuff and tried to do the best I could. And when he got to Beeville, Texas, he wrote me a note. And he said, who are you, what are you, and so forth. So I wrote him back a letter and told him what it was. I'm going to Bible school, and he wrote me back a note. He said, I don't know who you are, what you are. He said, the Lord laid on my heart to pay a whole year's worth of school for you. God was faithful. Boy, oh, I have had some trouble. Uh, what the black lady say, more trouble than Kevin got leaves. Oh, I've seen rough water as far as the ministry, rough water. I've always found God to be faithful. Amen. Because Christ was aboard. When he's aboard, my friend, it may look like he's going to drown. When he's aboard, you know, faith, faith in who he is, who he is, you just get him to know Christ. Get him to know Christ. Redeem the time. Don't take, take, don't take things too personal. If I said something tonight about you as a man or you as a lady, I did not promise you I didn't mean anything about that personal. I promise you I did. Don't take things too personal. You know? And what was the other one? What was the other one? Redeem the time. Right? Redeem, redeem the time. Oh, that's why for prayer. Our Father, just miserably, as fast as I can go through some things, and not in a preaching way, maybe more in a teaching way. Uh, trying to offer some help, please. These are some special people in this area right here. There's some special people in this room. These are your children, Father. Uh, we all have ups and downs in life. Lord, please, may we be as the, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul said, For I have learned, help us to learn these things. Help us to learn early in life. Not have to get old like me to learn these things. Then after we learn them, we didn't even see the last verse. Time's gone. Uh, we need to uh, abide by the things that we've learned. We need to stay by the things that we've learned. Lord, help us not to violate even the preaching 
uh, that we do. Thank you for the time that's mine behind this pulpit of wood. Uh, these others will come to speak in this special food. Thank you for it. Thank you for letting me be here tonight. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. 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 Don't you be like Junior Turtle. <laughs> you should be hiding behind some tree just waiting for something to go wrong. <laughs> God bless you. you can get hey. I don't know. Where's the boss man? Brother Kim is going to lead the song. Yeah. Okay, got you. Got you.